I'm Tom Sheehan. I'm Executive Vice Provost for Northeastern University, and I want to welcome you to this wonderful closing session we have planned for you for Northeastern's uh, AI in Action Week. Uh, this session is hosted by, is co-hosted by the Burns Center for Social Change at Northeastern and is part of the Center's uh, Rebooting Democracy in the Age of AI, talk about fortuitous cross-branding, because that's the name of this session as well, uh, but part of their lecture series. Uh, we've had an amazing week with AI in action this week, um, and this week's sessions have really highlighted the extraordinary achievements and advancements in AI already, showcasing the remarkable uh, strides in AI and illuminating the vibro ecosystem of innovation that thrives here at Northeastern. I'll take five seconds to say, or 10 seconds to say, that when we first conceived of this idea probably two months ago, uh, people said, oh, people are busy. They may not have time to do this. And uh, in true Northeastern fashion, we got an incredible number of proposals for talks that people wanted to give. and. Of course, we were so fortunate to have both an amazing opening night speaker as well as Minister, Minister Tang here for the closing session. So uh, it's really been a remarkable uh, collection of efforts to make this all possible. And I hope that you have taken advantage of this. I hope you'll also let me uh, or indulge me for a second to just thank the team that put this together. Um, you probably already know this, but these kinds of things take a village. And we have really had an extraordinary effort by a group. And I'm just going to do a quick run through, and I'm probably going to miss somebody. But my co-partner in this has been Megan Model, And then her amazing team and mine, Shauna Frazier, Becky Collett, Molly Liddell, Marlena Bravender, Christine Stegas, Courtney Frazee, uh, Christy Walker, Antoine Lilly, and Michael Calkins, among others, I'm sure. So a shout out to all of them. We have quite a session in store for you today. We're so honored to have with us uh, Audrey Tang, who serves as the inaugural Minister of Digital Affairs for Taiwan. And Minister Tang has really had uh, an amazing uh, background. And it started as a child. Uh, she practiced Taoism to moderate uh, strong emotions to survive a cardiac condition. She attended 10 educational institutions in 10 years and then decided to leave formal schooling to pursue self-education at the age of 14. In her 20s, uh, Minister Tang rose to prominence as a leader in free and open source software, revitalizing the Haskell and Perl programming languages while transitioning to become non-binary. During her 30s, she played a critical role in shaping GovZero, one of the most prominent civic tech movements worldwide. And in 2014, she provided support to broadcast the demands and resolve conflicts during a three-week occupation of Taiwan's parliament. Following this, she became a young advisor to a Taiwanese minister and after ensuing election, a minister herself. She helped to develop participatory democracy platforms such as VTaiwan and JOIN, bringing civic innovation into the public sector through initiatives like the Presidential Hackathon and Ideathon. Other accomplishments include shaping Taiwan's internationally acclaimed COVID-19 response, as well as safeguarding its 2020 presidential and legislative elections from foreign interference. Uh, please give a round of applause and who will join us shortly for Minister Tang. The conversation today will be led by our own Professor Beth Novick. Uh, Beth is a, obviously a professor here at Northeastern University where she directs the Burns Center for Social Change and its partner projects, GovLab and Innovate USA. Uh, Innovate US, I'm sorry. Uh, she's also a core faculty member at the Institute for Experiential AI. As if that's not enough, she's also the chief AI strategist for New the state of New Jersey and co-chair of the state's AI task force. Previously, she served in the White House as deputy chief technology officer and head of the White House Open Government Initiative and as a member of German Chancellor Angela Merkel's Digital Council. Her work focuses on using AI to reimagine participatory democracy and strengthen governance 
and she has spent her career helping institutions incorporate more participatory and open ways of working. You can see that we've put a powerhouse combination here together, and we're really looking forward to this conversation. So please join me in welcoming the esteemed Audrey Tang and our own Beth Novak for this conversation. you next to your coffee, you. the important place to be. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for that kind introduction, and it's wonderful to have you here. Um, what Tom didn't say to us at the outset, and I have the great pleasure to do, is that we are also here to celebrate the publication of your new book, Congratulations, which is known, the minister's new book is Plurality, the Future of Collaborative Technology and Democracy, which she co-authored with Glenn Weil, who is here in the audience. If we can have you uh, uh, wave, there we go. And we're just delighted. Um, and I want to recommend the book to everybody and hope that you will uh, check it out online and read it. Um, we're here, of course, during a very tumultuous week. And our hearts are heavy for the losses that were suffered in Taiwan with the earthquake that took place there. We are very glad that you are safe and with us, um, but we know that you face a daunting challenge ahead of you when you return. So while we have this brief break uh, to talk about the book and to talk about you, let's dive in. And uh, I think it might help people here just as we begin the conversation, if you would just give a very brief introduction to what a digital <coughs> minister actually does, especially the very first one in a country. Okay. So, <coughs> thank you for that question. Uh, I've been digital minister uh, in charge of social innovation, youth engagement, and open government uh, <laughs> since 2016, uh, which is a very new position. There was no such position um, in Taiwan. So, in 2016, I was asked to write my own job description, uh, which I will recite here. It's very short. It goes like this. Um, when we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's the entirety of my job description. So, uh, and by plurality, uh, we mean technologies for collaborative diversity. Taiwan is an incredibly diverse place with 20 and more counting national languages, with the high, one of the highest religious diversity in the world, which means that we have a lot of social conversations that could have been polarizing. Back in 2014, uh, during the Sunflower Movement, the administration enjoyed an approval rate of 9%. Uh, and um, the, the polarization was, was impossible. There is a sense of political helplessness and so on. So uh, my mission as digital minister is just to use technologies to ensure that we not only heal the polarization, but also create new cross-cutting conflicts where there's half of blue and half of green parties on this side and the other half on the other side, so that over time uh, we can become a place where conflicts is always turned into co-creation and not uh, overarching feuds uh, between ideological camps. It also helps that the in uh, Mandarin Shu Wei means both plural and digital. So in that, I'm the digital minister, but I'm also the minister for plurality. So at this moment, uh, as the Ministry of uh, Minister of Digital Affairs, I'm responsible for universal access, open data, data altruism and collisions and fabrics, um, you know, uh, collisions, whatever you want to call it, spectrum allocation, and so on. But as cabinet CIO, I'm also in charge of service delivery, AI, digital transformation, and so on. But also as chair of National Cybersecurity Institute, I'm in charge of defending against cyber attacks and information manipulation. So I want to pick up on that last point. Of course, this is part of the Reboot Democracy lecture series. You were kind enough, actually, you may not remember to have kicked off this series maybe four years ago. We had this conversation. But a lot has happened in the world since. And since this is AI week more broadly, I do want to just pick up on this point about cybersecurity. You just had an election 
Uh, I, I don't know if you want to tell people also what happened to you last week, but there is a very bellicose China in your rearview mirror. The whole world is very nervous now about the future of the semiconductor industry, which depends wholly on Taiwan. Yes. Uh, so I'm just wondering, before we get into talking, we I hope more about the hopeful future yes. and the innovations that you work on. Um, I'm just curious, tell us a little bit more about how your job relates to this yeah. work of trying to secure the global semiconductor industry and what this really means as we think about the future of AI. Yeah, um, the earthquake, although comparable uh, in scale compared to the one that we had in 99, which was really bad, killed a thousand and um, a week or more, uh, there was electricity connectivity problems and so on back then. Because of our investment in uh, resilience, uh, this time, um, it, well, it did still kill 10, but uh, the electricity, um, the low Earth orbit satellites, the mid Earth orbit satellites, everything uh, restored uh, service function very quickly. And I'm, uh, I read that TSMC and the supply chain is already more than 70% recovered and should be recovered uh, pretty soon. Uh, so we're very resilient against natural earthquakes. But to the unnatural one you just alluded to, <laughs> um, well, uh, that is a, a, a issue on everyone's mind. Um, indeed, during the election, we already know that the cheapest way uh, to disrupt Taiwan's uh, stability is just to polarize our society. So we have seen a lot of information ma manipulation attempts uh, that just look at existing polarizations in the society and try to amplify that. Um, not so different from during the pandemic, where there were similar attempts to create vax, anti-vax, mask, anti-mask, or whatever. Uh, divisions uh, in our society. Uh, we have been able to counter that uh, through pre-bunking, uh, like me deepfaking myself and sending to the society, uh, teaching people that deepfakes is coming, uh, that was two years ago, uh, or involving people in online citizen assemblies where we think about these things together and come up with good enough ideas that we can all live with. And all this was part of societal resilience. And I think as we keep doing this with more people at more scale, and deeper on things like TikTok or information manipulation online, things like that. It will create mutual trust like we have seen after the general election. Our effective polarization, meaning how people hate each other across party lines, is at very low at this point. It actually, I think, the lowest point uh, in the past decade or so because everybody feel that they participated uh, in the democracy, they, the, the, in the counting, in the live streaming of the counting, in the pre-bunking of the election breaking accusations or whatever. Uh, so at the end of the day, everyone feels they have won a little bit. So I'm cautiously optimistic that with a resilient society, whatever foreign adversary that wants to try cyber or information manipulation attacks will think twice because it actually backfired this time. So this is a, a great segue into my next question, which is really about how do you do all of this? Mm -hmm. How do you do this work that's both about maintaining a defensive posture when it comes to cybersecurity and creating resilience, and on the other hand, trying to innovate in how the government works, and then innovate in democracy, which we'll get into a little bit more. So maybe you could just say a little bit more, especially on this kind of front with regard to innovations in government. You did a lot during COVID. What have you been working on recently? Uh, and how do you do it all? Or is it just through deep fake cloning? And wait. Okay. No, nope, you're really here. OK, yes. High definition playing scale. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I think during the pandemic, um, every jurisdiction faces this trade-off uh, between like privacy and freedom of movement on one side and public health on the other. Um, and um, uh, in Taiwan, uh, the way we solve this trade-off is never by uh, the government's mandate uh, in like dialing a dial, uh, but rather by asking the civil society, are there better solutions that pushes the Pareto frontier that doesn't have to make such trade-offs? And indeed, in the civic tech communities, there are many people with very deep ec expertise in privacy enhancing technology, in zero knowledge technologies. Things are very esoteric to the public service, but they have been using that for quite a while because they're crypto nerds or something, right? Uh, and so because of that, our contact tracing system, for example, was invented by the civil society, 
by the very privacy advocates themselves uh, that leaves no trace through um, oblivious um, storage and decentralized uh, contact tracing. I'll spare you the details. But the idea is that anyone can just use their phone and scan a random code posted as QR code on a venue, which the venue printed itself is a random code that they have chosen it themselves. And it just automatically texts to 1922. And when it texts that, it stays in the telecom, which already know your phone number anyway. Uh, but you show that to the venue, which learns nothing about you. And after four weeks, that's deleted. Uh, and so you can also go to a website to see which contact tracing agent have seen your data in the past four weeks and so on. So it's also reverse accountability. And so all this is bread and butter, right, in this online PETS space. But had we had to use procurement or RFPs or what to do that, we cannot um, you know, do that in three months while during the pandemic we have to do that in three days. Uh, and so because it's decentralized, because people can print their own QR codes, we have more than two million adoption within like the first 24 hours of introducing this contact tracing system which held until Delta and even the first wave of Omicron uh, until uh, the vaccine become generally available. So that's just one anecdote, but it shows that how people first, public-private partnership can scale beyond the existing thought trade-offs. Now, COVID, of course, and having a crisis, you know, never, never waste a good crisis, they say. But beyond that, you've been able to do so much more. Is there something special about what's happening in Taiwanese government or in Taiwanese society? Or is this about your having gone inside that's created this receptivity to accepting innovation from the outside, to saying, we'll let civil society build it and we'll adopt that innovation as opposed to we have to control it from top down. Uh, is it all about you? No, I think, I think I'm just one tentacle, right, of this global public code digital public infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, free and open so and liberal software movement uh, that uh, happens to have a good uh, testing lab in Taiwan. But the actual technologies we use, the PETS, they're not invented in Taiwan. Uh, the police system uh, that we use to uh, build bridges across people's ideas about Uber or other topics, that's from Seattle. Uh, the participatory systems of e-petition uh, that come from Reykjavik, uh, the participatory budget came from Madrid uh, and Barcelona, I have to mention both. Uh, and so anyway, so, so the point being uh, that there is a global community and Taiwan is not exceptional in inventing these things. But I think we've been particularly open in trying out new things together along with the global civic tech and open government community. We don't want Spanish people trying to assassinate you as well as ch Chinese people trying to assassinate you. So uh, well played there. Let's shift to talking about the book and what we're really here to talk about, which is democracy and the intersection with AI. So in this really magisterial book, um, you write that technology and democracy are currently in conflict in most liberal democracies, with technology seen as either breaking down social fabric or increasing centralized control. Do you want to explain that a little bit more for us? It's called techlash, right? Like people are new to this idea. Not, not many. Okay. Well, some people are. So <laughs> I, I see a few uh, heads um, shaking. So the, the idea is really very simple. Um, technologies, uh, when they are in the hands of a few and opaque to many, uh, creates a social dynamic in which that the agency, that is to say the ability to do some direct action, um, is uh, diminished because while you can find people of similar ideas, interests, and whatever online, somehow it always leads to people hating each other, very interestingly, uh, or people distancing away from each other, or people finding that tribalism uh, or whatever engagement uh, they their algorithm uses amplify those voices uh, that uh, introduce toxicity and things like that. And so, of course, we know that these large platforms have trust and safety teams that they invest uh, in such technologies to moderate uh, in theory. Uh, but what we have not seen is a meaningful, like, grassroots organization uh, of people for things that they care about. Often they occur in spite of those large 
social media or a large platform of broadcasting or things like that. Uh, they find their own niche, like Mastodon or whatever uh, groups to to unify with. And so, very interestingly, uh, not many people in democratic movements, in professional facilitation or things like that, think, oh, it's best if we just get everybody gets online and magically we will have consensus. <laughs> There's been uh, a in the past few years, especially after the pandemic, a return to face-to-face -face settings, to trusted and safe spaces spaces in communities where the use of technology is minimal. It is just to capture the um, recording and make a transcript and maybe summarization and nothing more. Uh, and so that is the distance that we're seeing from the democracy communities, especially deliberative communities and uh, uh, you know, uh, communication at scale, very large platforms. And so part of the book is trying to not explain this gap which everybody can feel, but rather propose ways where people can move into the middle by a new generation of pro-social social media and not anti-social social media. Oh, so I have to ask you very quickly, you and I were both at a major tech company this week and uh, at a conference and I was struck by a comment that was made by some somebody, you were in the room when someone else said, you people are all so nice, why are your platforms all so awful? And uh, does, is there, can this work in a world, can the world that you are talking about of a more pro-social digital democracy work in a world of privatized platforms and in a world of AI that is in the hands of private companies? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, so, because that event was Chatham House, well, I will not say who said this, uh, but I, I think we'll have this another person after us, then. right? Exactly. Uh, yes, a non-best, non-Audrey person uh, said that, uh, and then I think the general feeling there is that even if those bridging system that creates consensus or at least consent uh, over polarization or whatever works perfectly, as long as they are in the hands of a few. Uh, it creates a dynamic where it becomes a better authoritarian governance system rather than a good democratic um, system, right? People would just defer their agency to such omnipotent everything seeing whatever. So transparency would be reversed being people become transparent to that apparatus and that apparatus still isn't transparent to the people. So it's not just about building AI system that can co-create consensus out of conflict. It is also to ensure that like any four people in a room or any these many people in the room can in their own laptops, in their own hardware, run such systems in such a way that at least allows tuning. Uh, we won't talk about pre-training, but at least tuning uh, toward uh, our own reward models, things that felt interesting or at least culturally appropriate to the norm of this room. And if we can do so on edge devices, then we have a real chance of rebuilding the public square, starting from a small park like structure instead of being a franchise of, you know, Mac Public Square or something like that. So what does this look like now as a practical matter in Taiwan? So what are you doing to do democracy differently now uh, with AI in Taiwan? Yes. And what will you be doing in the in okay. the next years? Yeah, so in the past year, uh, so in last year's Summit for Democracy around a year ago, uh, we started with the Collective Intelligence Project, SEIP.org, uh, this idea called Alignment Assemblies. The idea is that any community can use open source tools such as Polis uh, or our ideas. The first one was our ideas uh, to ensure that people can say what they want about how AI should behave. Like AI shouldn't discriminate based on you know ableness or whatever, right? Uh, and in all our ideas, the idea is that everyone participating will see two choices, and they have to rank which principle is better. Uh, and as long as sufficient amount of people do this, uh, the bridging statements start to emerge, consensus start to emerge. Uh, the, everybody's pushed toward the Pareto frontier, where real trade-offs are made instead of those loose-loose solutions that we see um, in many policy making. Uh, and so when a room of, say, 1,000 people do that, uh, we have a result matrix of uh, cohering, blending, volition. And then we take that 
and then in uh, the training of AI models, there, there's this idea of uh, alignment tuning, meaning that we take a pre-trained model and we say, okay, here's this group of people and they have these preferences. I'll put your result in such a way that it will gain approval from this very diverse uh, group uh, who nevertheless value on some very abstract principles. So Anthropic, which is a company that makes a model called Claude uh, in Claude 3 Opus, uh, included such a constitution document co-created via Polis with 1,000 statistically representative American people, uh, and they found that it performs equally well with the constitution created by researchers, but far less discriminating. Uh, that is to say, it's more fitting to the social norms. And in Taiwan, we have people in Taipei, people in Tainan, in different cities, which has different norms uh, to co-create. And again, everybody can start such things by themselves because the tools are open. And so in our Taiwan, our sovereign model, the Tai the, the trustworthy AI Dialga engine uh, is open source uh, and will be uh, fully open source, I think, in a week or so. And what's our expectation is that a small group, a university, a business, or whatever, would just run their internal alignment assemblies and stack upon the constitutionally aligned AI models so that those models fit the local norm in that organization. So as part of talking about democracy, and I want to come back to more of these conversations about civil society and alignment with AI and what's happening, but you just had an election, uh, which for most people when we say democracy, they hear election. Um, you are the first of countries now around the world who are going to go to the polls this year. It's probably the year in which more countries are going to have elections than every, any other year in history. And there is obviously a lot of concern about the role of AI in elections. Has there been interesting experiences um, from your perspective? Are you worried about the deep fake problem? And are you worried about AI's impact on elections? Or are you hopeful? And what does it mean now to think about doing elections differently in the AI age? Yeah, uh, we already knew that there will be deep faked or cheap faked um, short videos about election rigging, about counting. Uh, we, we already know that because uh, it's, it's so obvious, like everybody would just try it, why not, right? It's now so easy to generate those short clips. Uh, and so we pre-bunked, not just by me deep faking myself uh, to the citizens, but also um, do a really paper-only counting process that's still very efficient, finish in four, four hours. Uh, but we made sure that as we take each legislator or presidential uh, ballot, uh, there's like three or more YouTubers with recording devices belonging to different parties. We have three major parties. Uh, and each count has to show to those three different angles so that there is video documentary of each and every vote. Uh, and so when right after the election, predictably on um, short video platforms, those election rigging short videos uh, appear and that tries to polarize people. Uh, the party leadership of, of all three uh, major parties checked with their local YouTuber that recorded that particular county station and they all came out and say that was fake. And, and when all the three leaders say that, that's disinformation that manipulation cannot spread anymore, right? It's fully inoculated. And uh, this is just one example, but I think, uh, um, in general, um, the idea of using ICT technology only on the defensive side, like live streaming the counting, and not on the potentially risky offensive side, uh, like you know electronic voting machines, uh, would be my main suggestion to the countries going to the polls this year. So now taking, let's go to the day after the election day, then the other 364 days, which is frankly so important in terms of solving problems for real people in their lives. Have you seen anything you're particularly excited about or work that you're doing or that you've observed elsewhere that's really about either delivering services that help people or solving problems, making policy, doing the kind of hard work of governing that happens after the election? Yeah, uh, so we just had another alignment assembly, one that's not about tuning our sovereign model. Uh, it's the alignment assembly around information integrity. Uh, basically, uh, we sent again, um, I think 170,000 random SMS messages uh, to random numbers uh, of Taiwan uh, from this single number called 111, which is the SMS number that all government communications come from. Uh, we're switching to this regime where unless 
address is a short code or someone you met face to face, every other mobile number is probably a bot. Right, so so we're shifting to a new epistemic norm. Right, so like it's either blue tick or people you have exchanged uh, uh, face to face, um, and so from that one one one, people know it's from the government, and they feel it's pre survey about what they feel are the most uh, important uh, issues about AI harms caused online on large platforms, and then a statistically representative sample of uh, five hundred people uh, got the invitation of microcosm of which four hundred and fifty attended this entire day, which is very high engagement rates. People really want to talk about this, and with the help of the Stanford uh, online deliberation platform, uh, there's this AI facilitator, right? That not just people who don't speak as much. Uh, it allows interruption, but just for five seconds. It does real-time transcription. It does summarization. It of uh, uh, surfaces the common unknowns that the group feels they have to ask the experts, they do use board uh, accounting to vote on those, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so after uh, uh, six hours or more of these things, we now have a very comprehensive picture on how to counter the AI harms. For example, there was a highlighted harm about celebrities being a voice cloned. Uh, and in online advertisements, uh, they would just click through the advertisement into a encrypted chat with that celebrity, uh, but that not just the vocal model, but the prosody, everything with clones now. Uh, and that is a huge issue on transnational fraud uh, detection because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. It's very difficult to discover such things. And then the sub, uh, suggested solution, very simple, is just to require digital signatures that has a very strong KYC, like over-the-counter KYC uh, in the government uh, registration counter. Uh, you have to sign that before you can post any advertisement uh, on, on Taiwan. Uh, and so that basically solves the problem of content detection because you don't have to rely on that or watermarking anymore. You can just go back to the root. If it's not signed, then it's fake. So this is just one microcosm of one statement. But we're taking these and making new laws based on the rough consensus of the people like in real time. We can afford to do this like every other week. Are these kinds of summarization uh, um, functionalities the thing you're most excited about when it comes to the evolution of these participatory mechanisms? You've been running online engagement with citizens for years and years. For those who don't know, uh, the V Taiwan process that you pioneered helped with the crafting of 26 pieces of national legislation in which hundreds of thousands of citizens have been involved. How has that evolved? What are you, are, what's worked, what hasn't worked? What do you want to do differently in terms of these participation mechanisms? Yeah, the V Taiwan uh, experiment was very helpful in the sense that it convinced the career public service that uh, it is actually lower risk if you ask people, like random crowd of people, questions well before you have a draft. Uh, back 10 years ago, that's deeply counterintuitive. People uh, in the career public service would think if we share our drafts, people are going to protest, people are going to flip the table and things like that. Uh, you know, you're the original open government person. I don't have to explain this uh, to you. Uh, but um, police and similar tools that Vitaon uses convince everyone that those energies, as long as they're co-creative, uh, then it's not like polls where people protest because the post questions was written by the higher ups. This is a wiki survey where the poll questions are written by our fellow citizens and that made a world of difference. It's like people learning together, right? So that's the thing that worked. The thing that didn't work was that V Taiwan required a lot of face to face, very close coordination uh, between the facilitators, civil society leaders, and so on. And because during the three years of pandemic, all that we didn't have lockdown. Um, that just didn't work very well over at mosques. Uh, and so uh, the face-to-face the -face, um, convening um, kind of went down. Uh, many of the V Taiwan contributor pivoted to do uh, pandemic control and things like that, which is, of course, very saves lives. But after that, uh, V Taiwan pivoted a, a bit into a project uh, that explores the most advanced AI uses, like far beyond some 
polymerization, uh, AI nudging, uh, AI bridging of cultural differences across linguistic differences, political bridging, and things like that. So it becomes somewhat of a research project that is now partially funded by OpenAI. Uh, and then in the government, we have the join platform, which continues to run very well uh, during the pandemic. Very good participation rate is where people go to for e-petition, participatory budgeting, and all that. Mm. And in the book, though, you take us into a further off future, yeah. into a world of immersive, immersive shared reality yes. technologies. What is that little further off future? So maybe not this year, but mm -hmm. the year after. Oh, yeah. So um, we experimented uh, with that, uh, I think, since 2016, when I first know that I will become a minister. But before I'm actually made a minister in October, I was in Paris. And we had a conversation about children's rights online or whatever, uh, a, a general purpose far range conversation with junior and senior high school students. And so that uh, went, uh, that took place in highfidelity.io, which was a VR, social VR platform. And I modeled myself and I donned this uh, HTC Vive, and I shrunk myself to the size of the junior high school students. Uh, and so uh, to them, they're not looking up to, to me anymore. Uh, we're just sharing this playground, and we're uh, just experiencing things together. So I'm deeply convinced that if we can literally step into each other's shoes, it makes the, the rapport part, the uh, emotional support part of deliberation much easier to connect, which is something Something that polis or our ideas can never replace. <laughs> we built something called Democracy Island in Second Life years right. ago, exactly. except I didn't shrink myself. I made myself six feet tall because <laughs> with our avatars, we always want to live our fantasy. Um, are you worried about the uh, virtual escapism or the isolation, though, that technology also engenders, the, the, the phenomenon that so many people have written about of what happens when we grow up behind our screens? We don't see that in Second Life, do we? <laughs> I was there too, uh, helping to build a Second Life search engine. But anyway, instead of uh, walking down the memory lane, uh, I, I think I think the 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 Second Life experience showed me that as long as the fundamental protocol is interoperable, there are also people who run like Open Grid or things like that that provides a Second Life experience without having to buy those Linden dollars or whatever, right? So uh, the point being. Uh, the initial prototypes may not be open source or public code. When we first used Polis in 2015, it was proprietary, right? It was only later when we say that like rigor and civil society organization reproducibility is important and so on, we finally convinced Colin and friends into a non-for-profit computational democracy project. Yeah. So it's okay to be proprietary uh, on your first or second tries, but over time, if it's moving toward a place where it's interoperable, uh, like how Threads.net now joins the Fediverse so you can build your own user experience, your own front ends, then I think this capture of isolationism, the threat is much lower because that stems from the uh, misaligned incentive of the shareholders of large platforms want you to keep you engaged uh, in a uh, fast thinking and instead of a slow thinking mode. But if people build their own uh, worlds in Minecraft or whatever, then these incentives aren't there and therefore less of those isolationist problems. So we're about to transition to your questions. So if we have a mic that's about to go around, um, I'm going to ask you one more thing as we to give people a chance to percolate what they want to ask. But uh, we're going to be taking questions in just a second. But I want to pivot briefly to the fact that we have a lot of students in the room and potentially, I think, probably many more online. So what advice do you have for the students here and the lifelong students here um, before we wrap up, is what advice do you want to give folks here as they think about their future careers in the age of AI? How do they get to grow up to be you? Well, don't don't be me. <laughs> okay, um, I, I strive myself uh, to be a uh, good enough ancestor. Meaning, uh, instead of foreclosing futures uh, for next generations, instead of designing too good systems that prevents uh, new systems from happening, uh, we make sure that you know there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. We uh, make sure that we open up uh, to our 
gaps, our cracks. Um, during the pandemic at the time, we were enjoying like 92% of approval rates. And I publicly thanked the 8%, the people who kept us honest, the people who uh, you know, push the Pareto front, who say you can be even more privacy preserving, who said that you can be zero knowledge and, and things like that. And so uh, be those people. Uh, to Instead of, you know, being complacent, uh, think about ways where existing trade-offs only make sense in a kind of legacy mindset. And if you think outside of that, then you can become a reverse mentor. In Taiwan, each and every cabinet member can appoint one or two people younger 35 as reverse mentors. I was once, but I'm very old now. I'm, I'm 42, 43. <laughs> so, uh, so I have my, my own reverse mentors now uh, who are young advisors that keeps reminding me the trade-offs in my mind was a relic of the past. And new trade-offs can be done now that goes far beyond the Pareto front. And so be that person and be that 8%. Love it. Questions, and uh, I want to make clear that there's a preference here for the uh, students uh, first, lifelong students second. Where's our mic or our hands? Okay, I have a question up front here. Sure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jazz. I'm one of the co-ops for the Burn Center AI for Impact program under Beth. Um, thank you so much for the talk, Minister Tong. Uh, this was really valuable. One question I wanted to follow up on regarding the polarization and elections questions that were asked earlier. As you identified, we are in a world of polarization, especially politically and I believe even culturally and ideologically. How do you fight against these, you could call subversive tactics such as those employed by Russia's post-KGB on the U.S. and even sometimes internally in our own borders, as an individual, when all of these things are quilted and made ever more complex and veiled in the world of technology, especially with AI? That's a great question. So um, personally, uh, my hobby uh, for many years is called troll hugging. Uh, I, I hug trolls. Troll hugging. You know, some people hug trees. I hug trolls. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, troll hugging uh, is defined as uh, so people sometimes make personal attacks to me online. Uh, maybe they write 300 words, uh, like very vicious, very toxic. Uh, and I challenge myself to find in that corpus uh, like three words or five words that can be constructed as constructive. Uh, and so then I construe them as constructive uh, and then reply them uh, in good faith uh, as if all, those, all these other words doesn't exist. Uh, and then uh, I reply them uh, with humor. Uh, and so I think this idea, which was generalized into something called humor over rumor, uh, is uh, to understand that humor in these contexts travel faster than outrage. Uh, and uh, probably the only emotion that travels faster than outrage. Uh, and all these polarization attacks, uh, they dissipate if you, you laugh about it, if the tension uh, is, is, is left out right, uh, of the conversation. Uh, and so um, I have this Flickr account where you can find me in Creative Commons Zero free of copyright doing all the memes that you can see on the internet. Uh, and so uh, whenever something like that happens, I can just post a meme of myself. And my staff can just, you know, Photoshop or caption whatever funny things and post it uh, about it, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so this kind of diffusing the, the steam of polarization when coupled with pre-bunking of anticipating these attacks and educating people on how to participate in collaborative uh, fact-checking is like two halves, right, of a, of a sandwich, right? If you can anticipate, you pre-bunk, you do inoculation and so on. For the few things you cannot, uh, you just create humor. So the next time people think about it, they think about something positive. And so over time, new polarizations are made uh, because the old polarization axis no longer work. Uh, and so for each and every new societal challenge, we try to frame it in such a way that is orthogonal to the previous polarization division points. Okay, more questions. And we can alternate between the student and the lifelong students in the room. So, 
Let's see where, oh, we've got a hand in the back there. Oh, good, another, oh, two, one here, and then we'll take one there. Do you want two, two at once or one at a time? Um, depending on how long this oh, sure. is. Let's see. <laughs> Hello. Let's, and I'll ask you to Hello. keep the question yeah. brief. Yeah, sure. I just have two short questions. Um, the, thank you for the discussion. Um, my name is Sundar. I'm a PhD student in neurosciences here. Uh, my first question is: um, You talked about like the advantages, the pros and cons. Really close. To Sorry, you. like uh, in a line, like okay. this. <laughs> the pros and cons of AI, and also you talked about like how to involve people in using AI for you know like different governmental schemes and agendas. Uh, my question is like, how do you like, despite the multitude of cons that AI has, but there are also like some exceptional pros that we can benefit from. Um, as a minister, like how do you convince people to, you know, have the trust in AI that, you know, it could be used for the collective good of people? Because my dad currently he's in Taipei right now working. So he's very skeptical about using AI or any sort of like digital tools for any of his work. So as, as a government and as a minister, like how do you do that? And my second question is uh, from few talks that I attended part of this AI action week is that using AI in like healthcare like especially in digital health uh, the cost can be like reduced tremendously in terms of like what we're doing in pipeline process what's Taiwan's state right now in incorporating AI in digital health okay. thank you Great. Well, I can take three hours <laughs> it's like a symposium <laughs> uh, question uh, okay um, to the first um, I think the government ministers should trust the people, not the other way around. So uh, I, I radically trust my fellow citizens. Some of them may trust back, but that's not required. Uh, and by trusting the people, I mean, for example, by sharing our sovereign model, Taida, as Apache license, so everybody can run it on their own laptop. Uh, that's trusting people, because whatever they run, or locally fine-tune, or whatever, Man, many of them will do do good, right? Uh, reply to email faster or things like that. Some of them will do bad. They will flip the reward model and create conflicts online. Uh, but by trusting our people, it means that they have the freedom uh, to do that on the edge. Um, the n the non-trusting version of that would be just keeping you know API access and monitoring each and every input string right that our citizens enter uh, to our AI system, but we do not do that. So radically trusting the citizens, uh, to my knowledge, is the only sure way to earn back some of those trust in the future. To give no trust is to get no trust. This is the first um, uh, answer. Um, the second answer, um, Taiwan, very interestingly, has a universal healthcare system that you cannot opt out from. Uh, and it's extended to residents also, not just citizens. Uh, and just short plug, if you contribute to open source or any internet commons for eight years or more, you're automatically eligible for Taiwanese residency, uh, including <laughs> that healthcare. Uh, just uh, apply for a digital gold card online. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, Glenn is a good heart holder. Uh, and if Glenn stays in Taiwan for less than half a year every year, he doesn't have to pay taxes. So it's all good size, no bad size. Anyway, so the point being uh, that those citizens <laughs> and residents who enroll in the healthcare, uh, just a couple years ago, our constitutional court ruled that they must have opt out options. Uh, to AI training using that universal healthcare data, which is a very different place uh, from Europe, right? Europe starts from the place where you have to opt in. Uh, and then uh, there's now new data re reusability laws or things like that that says if sufficient amount of PETS is applied, then some of them may be exempt. We started from the other side. <laughs> like by default, uh, it's used to train AI models. Uh, but now people are now opting out of it if they want. Uh, and so, um, but the constitutional court ruling also said that uh, if in places where like pandemic control or whatever, uh, that we don't uh, offer those opt out, it needs to be very, very strict. It needs to be essentially zero knowledge. So not like with reasonable technical implementation, you cannot reverse it. No, uh, mathematically, you must prove that the, you cannot re-identify pr uh, personal data from that data set, which calls for a new generation of like multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, things were once considered too expensive to compute. Uh, now we have to invest in the chips or whatever uh, to do that. And so to your question, I think previously, uh, in the name of the public good and universal healthcare, uh, we were very, um, 
how to, how to say that politically, uh, very um, conveniently uh, using these uh, of society data sets for research and things like that. But now we're moving to a more GDPR compliant way to do that with a twist of new uh, next generation PETS. Jay, in the back, you had a hand up. Hello, uh, my name is Jay. I am the Artificial Intelligence and Social Impact Fellow for the Byrne Center and a Master's of Science of Media Advocacy student here at Northeastern. I also wanted to say I recently came out as non-binary, um, so I wanted to express my admiration for you as the first transgender cabinet minister in the world. I think that's something that needs to be said, um, so thank you. My question along those lines is, <laughs> along those lines, my question is about identity. In the conversation around your upcoming book, you said that digital identity is pivotal to securing rights within a digital world. So my question to you is, what do you mean by digital identity and how we can create online spaces that use digital identity as a unifying force rather than as a polarizing a force like d identity can be in countries like the United States? Yeah, I mean it in a very specific sense in that one needs to prove that across however many layers of intermediary or AI system or whatever, this, the person we're talking with is a person. Uh, and, and this is harder than it looks like nowadays, right? Now that with the acoustic models, the face models, the, the prosody, everything, um, you know, if you have seen the Sora demo, imagining that working in real time. Uh, and so then probably all the epistemic backstops of what constitutes as per a proof of personhood is gone. Uh, and so, um, but still we need to work with each other across geographic instances. We still have to coordinate. Uh, we cannot degenerate into a world where, you know, I have to touch me here to ensure that I'm a person uh, and, that, uh, and then uh, that trust uh, just cannot extend the, the minute I walk out of the store. Or we, we cannot live in that world, right? Uh, and so um, it's, uh, concretely implemented in two things. One is uh, some way for people physically in the same room who have run like KYC processes. Uh, it's an old idea called Web of Trust. Uh, back when PGP was was new, right? The idea is that we run those parties where people verify each other's pretty good privacy keys and verify each other's personhood. And then, like in a party of seventeen or whatever, uh, a threshold of like fifteen or whatever can vouch for a new uh, real person uh, into the Web of Trust. Uh, so that's like very niche, right? It's something geeks do. But nowadays, uh, it may become a necessity uh, if we're going to work with, you know, the reality that shapeshifters are everywhere online. Uh, the other thing, of course, is how to do selective disclosure. Uh, say that in this KYC party uh, that takes place in a government registration office or in Apple Store where you wear a Vision Pro to scan your retina or something like that, right? Uh, so, um, which may actually happen. Uh, and so all, all these things after this, then instead of uh, just revealing uh, your labels, your um, not just names, but also like gender identities or things like that wholesale. Uh, like if you present your driver's license, you're revealing a lot more metadata about you than just the fact that you're a person, right? So we need to design those uh, selective disclosures, zero knowledge systems, uh, verifiable credentials and things like that for that one transaction to prove that I'm over 18, but nothing more. Uh, I'm an 18 and I'm a human and nothing more. Uh, and uh, if the society shifts to that norm, then we get to keep or even enhance privacy uh, in a post-gen uh, AI world. But if we do not do that well as an infrastructure, we would degenerate into a real ID for online behavior system. Thank you. Please, uh, can we get a mic in the front here? Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Diane Grant. I'm also a co-op here with the Burn Center. Um, and I have a bit of a broad question, but I know as lifelong learners, I feel like we all kind of have like a sticky note or a notebook or something like a tab on our computer with all of the ideas and things we don't really get to or have time for. Like what's on that sticky note for you? What's kind of 
pushing the boundaries that you're excited to look into that you want us to carry the torch as young people? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, so in the plurality book, uh, plurality as collaborative diversity, there's actually two themes that are connected together. The first theme, which we talk about today, is how to, instead of polarization as a destructive force, use it as a co-creational force. And that's basically what those questions and conversations is about. But there's also another part of that, which is in the world in which those systems work so well, um, are the conflicts and diversity a non-renewable energy? Do we just become uh, a community of people who are so, you know, um, rough consensus and running code <laughs> so that uh, we end up with things that we can all live with uh, and there's no that 8% anymore. Uh, it, it, it's just people generally, continuously practicing democracy and resolving issues and so on. But that also runs into the issues of a local optimum, like people would just to stop there uh, and foreclose future possibilities. So another half of that research question is how to regenerate diversity, how to regenerate um, even dissent, how to regenerate this will to, to destruct uh, political systems and deconstruct and reconstruct and so on. This is less urgent now, uh, mostly because we're still in the exploding polarization phase. Uh, but this is uh, very important because if we cannot keep creating cross-cutting conflicts, then we do not have the ability as a polity uh, to improve democracy system. Democracy will just be good enough and then we will stop there, right? So for future generations, um, my hope as a good enough ancestor is never to be too good so that there is still some roof for, for dissent so that we can free the future together across generations instead of thinking about solutionism for this generation. So regenerating diversity and conflict, that is my invitation to you. On that note, I know that there's probably many more questions in the room, so um, I will have to recommend to you that you read the book to get the answers. Uh, if we want to bring that back up, just as a reminder, uh, the book is called Plurality, the Future of Collaborative Technology and Democracy. Link there, yes, plurality.net uh, slash English. So congratulations very much on the publication, and to you, Glenn, as well, really. Uh, a magnum opus, and we're so grateful thank that. Thank you very much. Let me just say, I just want to invite people not just to read, but to co create. Yeah, send us pull requests. So like, uh, this is, this is not wait, wait, Mike, let's put the, we'll bring the mic to you. Hang on. Think of this like a Google Doc. Don't think of this like a paperback book, even though it will be a paperback book as well. You all, it belongs to all of you, I hope, and everyone who comes to one of these events, everyone who thinks about it, is is invited to m make this with us, tell the future of technology um, together. Yes, and it's Cricket Common Zero, meaning that if you subset the book and add your name on it and take our names out <laughs> and say it's your <laughs> book, we cannot sue you. So make it yours. <laughs> Thank you. It is. Uh, if you're, however, in my class, this does not count as your final project, though. <laughs> <laughs> With that, let me thank our hosts here at Northeastern and AI Action Week. Thank you to Tom and to Megan and your teams for having us as part of this phenomenal series. I want to also thank from the Burns Center, Bonnie and Aubrey and Jay and Susan. Thank you very, very much. And to all of our students for being here. Thank you to the sign language interpreter, which is happening. It's happening over there. You can't see it, but it's uh, to our left. Um, so thank you to the interpreter for uh, their service in this. Um, uh, uh, the minister is one of several talks in our Reboot Democracy in the Age of AI lecture series. We have a talk coming up, both online and in person, on April 11th at 5 p.m., together with the Department of Architecture, with the folks from Urbanist AI, if you know them, another open source collective doing really cool co-creation with citizens of urban planning. And then on May 16th, we will have Orly Lobel, author of the book The Equality Machine, uh, here to talk about AI and its impact on workers, the workplace, and how AI can be used to forge and create greater equality. So you can sign up for those at rebootdemocracy.ai. 
With that, we're so grateful to you for joining us. Thank you so much for making us a stop on your trip. And uh, thank you. Thank you.